Well, again, welcome those of you who are visiting with us. Uh, we hope that you uh, have been caused to sing about the glory of Christ because you felt compelled by who he is. Our eyes need to be open to see his beauty, his glory, his majesty, his supremacy. And the spirit is willing to do that. He's able to do that. As we sang, he opens blind eyes. He gives eyes to see. Do you need to see Christ in all his beauty and sufficiency for you? Because you might have come in here empty. You might have come in after wandering in the wilderness. You might have come in here discouraged. You might have come in here encouraged. But we all need to have our eyes fixed upon Christ again. And the way that the Spirit loves to do that is to show us Christ in his word. So as you open your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 1, let's read our text and let's appeal then to the Spirit of God to show us Christ. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, we'll read down to verse 18. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. Father, as we open your word specifically to a text that is beloved by Christians throughout all generations for the way that it puts forward in no uncertain terms the supremacy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's him that we long to know, to see, to trust, to obey, to worship. We recognize that we have come in here having had all different sorts of weeks highs and lows. We've experienced tragedy. We've experienced the mundane. But that is life in this world. And to keep trudging on with the purpose and the focus that we need to have as pilgrims passing through a temporary time and a temporary place, we need to see our Savior, Jesus put before our eyes the Savior who is now glorified on high, exalted, sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high, ruling and reigning even now. And he rules and he reigns over his church, over his people, whom we are by grace. We ask that you would do a work in each of our lives, causing us to see him as we should, so we will serve him as we should. And we ask this for his glory and for our good. Amen. You know, in many countries, uh, kings and queens are mere figureheads. In other words, they, they appear to hold an important and often a supremely powerful title or an office. Um, they look nice on postage stamps. They, their picture is emblazoned on the currency of the land. They receive all kinds of honors. They perform many ceremonial functions. But in reality, they exercise little or no actual power in, in the lives of the citizens of the country. If they are consulted, it's only as a formality. 
like a figurehead that sits on, on the prow of a ship. They are seen as the head. They represent the country, but they don't function as the actual authority in that country. They drive by in their, in their motorcades on special occasions. They, they wave at the crowd. The admiring subjects line the streets. But afterwards, the subjects go home. And they go about living their lives as usual. Maybe the, well, for the most well-known figurehead for our generation is the late Queen Elizabeth II. For 70 years, she was queen of 15 Commonwealth realms. She was head of the Commonwealth, but she had no power over the nations in which she was not head of the government. She did not exercise power in her own realms, on her own initiative. Same can be said of the Emperor of Japan, King of Sweden, right? That is not to say that they are not beloved by their people, but in terms of power, they're just figureheads. And there are many churches today that would read Paul's words that we've read here in verse 18 to simply say Christ is figurehead of the body, the church. They speak of Christ as if he's important, as if he's powerful. His name is mentioned in connection with their ministry They sing songs about their love for him. They claim to be subject to him. But in practice, he exercises little to no actual authority over their church or over their lives. They do things their own way. They have their own priorities. Think about how many churches are known for their celebrity pastors or their worship leaders because of how many songs they've released. Think of how many churches are about politics or social activism. Christ's name is mentioned, but his influence and his leadership there are absent. He's nothing more than a figurehead. The scriptures do not speak of an impotent Christ. They speak of one who is supreme over all things. And it is understanding the supremacy of Christ that is the key to your growth as a Christian. You simply will not love and live for Christ as you should if you don't see him as he is. You need to see that Christ is supreme because he's God. He is the full disclosure of God to man. There is no knowing God apart from knowing Jesus Christ. And all who are in Christ by faith They've been recreated, as it were, by, by the Spirit of God. They have put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And in glory, God will bring about their full conformity to the image of Christ. You also need to see that Christ is supreme because he is the creator. Paul calls him here the firstborn of all creation. He holds the place of highest rank, the highest honor being that all things were made by him and through him and for him. 
Nothing exists that is not subject to his authority. And all men of every age, they will bow before him. Not even death can keep man from bowing before God. He will call their names and they will rise from the grave. There is no escaping Christ. There is no saying, well, when death, it's all over, I won't have to worry about him. No, that's when you need to worry about him most, if you died apart from him. There is no escaping this glorious, supreme Christ. We also need to see Christ's supremacy over the church. He says here, Paul says, that Christ is head of the body, the church. Um, in Ephesians 4.15, Jesus is the one whom Paul says, he says, we are to grow up into all aspects, into him who is the head, even Christ. So, that means Christ is both the origin and the destiny of the church. And in fact, the church can only fulfill her role by continually growing in our understanding of Christ, in submitting to his headship over the church. So he is far from being some distant lifeless, impotent figurehead. He is actively reigning over the church, functioning as her head. And your life, Christian, it needs to be centered around him. Your life is not your own. You have been bought with a price so that your redeemed life through it, you might glorify him, and you might proclaim his excellencies. This world. Just this week, just this week, you have been offered multiple times to pursue pleasure, wealth, possessions, prestige, leisure in opposition to Christ. They've been offered to you to appeal to you, to your fleshly nature, to make you say, this is better than Jesus. And they're all vain pursuits. And you will prove how empty they are and how unable they are to satisfy you if you keep on pursuing them but you will only realize it after wasting your life. See, there is only one reliable, faithful, sufficient, satisfying foundation for your life, and his name is Jesus Christ. And you need to center your life around him. And what will cause you to center your life around him is seeing his supremacy as head over the church. So we're looking at the supremacy of Christ over the church. We began looking at, that, at this last week, so this is part two of a sermon we began last week. As the church's sovereign and supreme head who is reigning over her, we're looking at six essential duties that he performs. I'm going to briefly review the three that we looked at last week, last Sunday, and then We'll proceed on with the remaining three. Christ's first duty as head of the church is he sets the priority and the agenda of the church. He sets the priority and the agenda of the church. Jesus just didn't leave it to us to figure out what we're going to do. He's not interested in how, in how uniquely we can come about worshiping him or living for him. No, he tells us what to do. He sets our agenda. He's reigning right now over his church as her head. He sets what her priority and agenda is to be until he returns. There's three priorities that Christ has set for us. 
The church's first priority is to make disciples of Christ of all the nations. Two main texts where Christ makes this clear. Christ holds his disciples, uh, he told his disciples before he ascended that the Father has given him, he said in Matthew 28, he says he's given him all authority in heaven and on earth. And what is that authority directed towards? Making disciples in all the nations. He has sovereign authority to operate in any way that he desires to enable his church to make disciples amongst all the nations of the world. And so they're to accomplish this, not in their own strength, not with their own ingenuity. No, he tells us how we're to go about this. He says we're to be his witnesses wherever we go. We're to do what witnesses do. We testify about who Christ is. We testify about what his death accomplished for sinners. Our priority as a church every week is the same. We preach Christ from the scriptures. And why does this never get old? Because Christ is infinitely beautiful. There are aspects of Christ that we could look at from now until the day we die and we would never grow tired. We would never be ho-hum because he's infinitely beautiful and glorious. And we do this from the scriptures, which are sufficient to proclaim everything we need concerning life and godliness, which is why Christ is at the center of the scriptures. He is who we need. And so we speak of him. Week after week, God's people need to be pointed to the one whom they are following, proclaiming his glorious excellencies and sufficiency to satisfy, to strengthen, to supply our every need. And the response of his disciples, the ones who who hear his gospel and respond in faith, the response of the disciple is submission, service, sacrifice, gratitude, worship. And as we make disciples of Christ, we're to secondly train up men to lead the church like Christ. We make disciples of Christ and we train up men who will lead like Christ. And Christ, being the head of the church, he gives us the criteria to look for. How do we know? How are we to know who should lead the church? Is it, is it the businessman who leads some Fortune 500 company? Is it someone who has made great business decisions, great investment decisions. He's independently wealthy. Is it the entrepreneur? Is it the people person? No. Business acumen, social influence, accumulated wealth, they have no bearing on one's ability to lead and to shepherd God's people. We need people. We need leaders who are like the shepherd. He tells us what they're like. He tells us what we're to look for. That's how we know who he's raising up. They have a character like Christ. They have a walk with Christ that can be modeled after. Serves as an example. And we're to be training up all men to do the work of ministry. And out of those faithful disciples, there will be some whom Christ is raising up to lead his church like Christ. The third priority that Christ sets for his church, it is to address serious sin with the authority of Christ. See, as a member of the church, you should expect to encounter sin on a regular basis. Think of it this way. I've been in the hospital this week, not me, uh, but I've been at the, I should say, I've been at the hospital this week. And you know what I saw? as I walked through the halls of the hospital, I saw sick people. There were sick people in the waiting rooms. There were sick people in the, in the little rooms in their bed. Some were sitting up watching TV, but they had tubes coming out of their bodies. Some were being wheeled around in, in wheelchairs because they couldn't walk. They might fall if they walked. Some of them were not conscious. Maybe they were asleep. Maybe they were in a coma. But you know what? They were 
all sick. And I was not shocked to see them there because I was at a hospital. That's where sick people go with the hope of being healed. Isn't that right? So why should we be shocked <laughs> when we come to church and find out there's sinners here? Every person who comes in here has been challenged in some way or in the same ways. We've been challenged to trust Christ. We've been challenged to believe that he's enough. And we're all coming in here weak. We're coming in here weary to varying degrees. We face multiple challenges to our faith, multiple tests to our obedience. Multiple burdens are on our minds. There's multiple regrets about our failures, too. And we're carrying all that in here. And, and I know I'm just like you. I walk in. Hey, how's it going? I'm doing good. How about you? Oh, praise God, right? And you don't see any of that behind it all. But we have to be a family. And to know that in a family, the smiles are put there for good reason. We don't want to walk in just, you know, looking like we haven't brushed our teeth and just got out of bed. That's how we are spiritually. We don't want to do that. But we come in here very needy after the week we've had. And so we shouldn't be surprised that everywhere we go in this building on a Sundays, we're running into bumping into other sinners. Churches where weak and battered and bruised sinners go with the hope of growing in strength and godliness through the means of his grace, fellowship of the saints, the preaching of his word, the singing of his praises. That's how God works in you and in me. That's why we're not to forsake our gathering together. I can't afford to forsake it. Oh, yes, you can. You're the pastor. Oh, no, I can't. I need you. I need your fellowship. I need what takes place here when the saints worship. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Making melody with your heart to the Lord. I need your admonishment. I need your prayers. This is how I come. And so we encounter one another. Sinner encounters sinner. And sometimes you're so wrapped up in where you're at and how difficult things have been that you respond to other people in sinful ways, selfish ways. Your eyes get on yourself. And that is why Peter admonishes Christians. He says, you keep fervent in your love for one another. Love covers a multitude of sins. You are going to need to be fervent in your love when you come here on a Sunday, when you gather in homes on Wednesday fellowships. Because you're going to encounter sinners there. And I would say that in most cases, <clears throat> It is best to just overlook another's sin. Overlook a perceived sin. It may not even be sin. It's just perceived sin. And we need to take Paul, uh, Peter's advice to, advice to heart. Overlook it in love. It's how unity among sinners is maintained. But when it can't be overlooked, and there are times when it cannot be overlooked because it's public. Everybody knows. And it's serious. And overlooking it would just cause harm and maybe even division within the church. Then Christ, who is our head, he tells us to go and speak to that person privately. 
He doesn't tell you to berate them. He doesn't tell you to get mad at them. He says, win them. Win them away from their sin. And this is not easy to do. It's, it's easier just to keep going and pretend like you never saw it. Never heard it. But see, Christ has put us all on a rescue mission that is compelled by love. Love for one another. Love for Christ. Right? So that means that when you go speak to them, as uncomfortable as it is, if they don't listen to you, he says, then you just keep expanding the number of concerned brothers and sisters until if they even refuse to listen to them then you eventually tell it to the whole church to air their dirty laundry no it's because this is your family in Christ this is your family and so we're going to do what family does we're going to plead and we're going to pray And we're going to urge them, beg them to repent. Don't keep going. And if after all that they still refuse to listen to the church, then we're going to treat them like the unbeliever that they are. We're not going to shun them. We're not going to be mean to them. We're just going to say, you're not following Christ. You're not living out the gospel of Christ. In fact, you're acting like you need the gospel of Christ. And so that's how we're going to operate towards you. You're acting like an unbeliever. not someone who says they're going to follow Christ. It's never about being mean or rude. It's never about embarrassment or shame. It's trying to convince them out of loving concern of their need to repent. And if and if and when they do, you know what we do then? We rejoice. And we receive them back, right back into the family of Christ. So addressing serious sin in each other It is a humbling and a sobering thing that Christ has called us to do because we all know that but for God's grace, then we can be ensnared by the deceitfulness of sin. But this is what members of Christ's church are to commit to doing for one another out of love and out of obedience to Christ. Christ is is the supreme head of the church. He sets her priority and her agenda and his church obeys. They make disciples, they train up leaders and they deal with serious sin. So as head, Christ also safeguards his church. Christ safeguards the church. It's in Ephesians chapter 5 we looked at last week where Paul links the husband's role as the head of the wife to Christ's role as the head of the church. Husbands are to be like Christ in the home. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. See, he characterizes his whole role of authority. It's covered in love. And that's why A wife can submit to a husband who's leading like Christ because it's compelled by love for her. So husbands are to use their authority to protect their wives in the same way that Christ uses his authority to save the church, to sacrifice for her, and to sanctify her. So it's an authority that is driven by love that is used to protect Thirdly, as the head of the church, Christ supplies the needs of the church, which he did primarily by asking the Father to send the Spirit, whom he so aptly calls the Helper. It's a title for the Holy Spirit from Christ himself. He's the Helper. He transforms our lives. He convicts us of our sin. He guides us in truth. He empowers our witness. He provides each of us with with spiritual abilities so that we can minister to one another. He works through our worship. He leads us. See, the Holy Spirit is absolutely indispensable for ministry. And Christ, in his supremacy, he supplies all the church needs to serve and to glorify him. So, picking up now, that's where we left off last week. The fourth duty that Christ serves as head, functions as head, 
is that he seeks those who are his people. Christ seeks those who are his people. See, many churches, you've heard it, they refer to themselves as seeker-friendly. Seeker-friendly. The Bible, though, says no one seeks for God. Look at Psalm 14, briefly. Psalm 14. Psalm 14 begins, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They're corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. The Lord's looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They've all turned aside. Together, they have become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. See, men don't seek God because they want nothing to do with God. Now, that's not to say men aren't seeking a type of God. The God that they're not seeking is the God who has revealed himself in the scriptures. Man lives his life as an enemy of the God spoken of here in the Bible. They live in rebellion against him, and it is to varying degrees. Not everybody is the same degree of rebel in their rebellion, but all of them are rebels. All of them are at enmity with God. And the reason is because of the spiritual state of man's heart towards God. It's such that no one seeks him of their own volition. Speaking of our spiritual state, the Bible declares that men apart from Christ are dead in their trespasses and sins. So it's not just that that man won't come, it's that he can't come. And Jesus expressed this when he said in John 6, he said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In other words, the only way that we seek God is if the Holy Spirit has first stirred our hearts with a desire for God. It's God who draws us to himself such that salvation from beginning to end, it's a work of God's grace, just like we sang. We sang about his grace. Salvation is a work of his grace from beginning to end. And because no one naturally seeks God, God seeks us. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden? They didn't seek God. They hid from God. What a picture of us. But what did God do? He sought them. And he's been seeking his lost loved ones ever since. See, Jesus gave this as his mission statement. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And those he seeks are the ones that he chose in him before the foundation of the world. How does he find them? That's a good question because this is where we become involved as his church. How does Christ seek his own? He does the seeking, but how? Well, he does it through us, doesn't he? He does it through his people. Through his people, he seeks those who are lost. How does he do this? Are we to go about searching for some distinguishing mark on a person that says somehow chosen. This one's chosen, so that's the one who comes. Okay, you come because God chose you before the foundation of the world. Is that what we're supposed to do? Absolutely not. Jesus, the head of the church, told us what he wants us to do. Look at Mark 16. Verse 15. He said to them, these are his disciples, when he's commissioning them, he says, go into all the world 
and preach the gospel only to the elect. It doesn't say that, does it? It says you preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. It's that simple. Our duty as the church is to preach the gospel to the nations. Those who believe will be saved. Those who disbelieve will be condemned. Our duty, though, is clear. Preach the gospel to the nations. No one but God knows who he has chosen. These are the secret things of the Lord. Only as you testify, right? Because we're to be his witnesses. Only as you testify of who Christ is, what he did on the cross, does the Spirit of God open blind eyes. Does he grant ears to hear? Does he transform stony hearts to flesh so that they will believe? Some come as children through the gospel being shared with them faithfully by their parents. Uh, some come as younger children, right, when they've been shared with by the gospel by a, a Sunday school teacher at church. Some come as teens, like I did, through the ministry of a youth group. Some come later in life. Maybe it's a tragedy, some kind of a wake-up call, and they finally admit the need to get this matter about heaven settled with me. Some wait till their deathbeds after they've been rebelling for years, running from God all their life. But all come only through hearing the gospel. So what is our job? We're to testify. We're to be the ones through whom the gospel goes forth. This is how Christ seeks those who are his, because he is the supreme and sovereign head of his church. That is what we are to be doing. Another duty that Christ performs as head of the church is he assesses and purifies the church. He assesses and purifies the church. Turn again to Revelation chapter 1, the last book we read from this <clears throat> earlier. Turn to chapter 1 of Revelation. So in this vision given to John, he says in 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard the, behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, right? And then he, he lists them all. And then he sees the voice of the one who's speaking to him. And look, at, listen to his description. I saw, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many's waters. Right? So John is trying to describe to us this glorious, majestic Christ now, who is reigning as supreme over his church. And the lampstands represent, they're just common lampstands, right? So they're just lampstands that, that shed light, but yet they picture these churches that John's supposed to write to. And he's walking amongst these lampstands. Why, why a lampstand being chosen for the church? What does a lamp do? It just... It just displays the light. It sheds light. And this is what the church is to be doing in the world. Shedding light. Displaying light. These lampstands are made of gold. So these lampstands are precious. Speaks of their preciousness. And this is what the church is to God. The church is precious. It's valuable. It's essential. It's how he works in the world. So much so that, that he purchased the church with his blood. And so these seven churches here, they represent real churches in the world at this time. But they, but they represent churches of all time at, at the same time. And 
Christ is moving amongst them. Remember, he, he promised. He promised to his disciples that he would be with his people even into the end of the age. So he's with them, he's amongst them, and he's pictured here in the glory of his truthfulness, his omniscience, his authority. And this one with all authority, he, it says here, he holds in his hand the churches, and not just the churches, the men who lead these churches. In his right hand, verse 16, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its strength, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me, saying, don't be afraid. I'm the, one, I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels here. And that just doesn't have to mean, the, we don't want you to think of that as heavenly angels. Angels, the word for angels here is just messengers. These are the messengers of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. That's who he has. I'm in amongst these churches. And I hold in my hand the men who lead these churches. And listen to what he says. This one who is in complete control, this one who gives his life, this one who sits in judgment, who decides everything related to the church. This is what he says to the church in Ephesus. And we'll just look at this one. He says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance that you, you cannot tolerate evil men. You put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you have found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and you have endured for my name's sake. You've not grown weary. You're doing all these different kinds of good things. But verse 4, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. You are going through the motions. It was not this way at the start. But you, you have sunk to the place where you are just simply carrying out your Christian responsibilities simply because you're supposed to. So the the honeymoon is over. You're, you're clocking in and you're clocking out. And that vital love for me that initially compelled you to do all those things, that has now been replaced by duty, apathy, indifference, worldliness, traditionalism. This is what you do. And this one with all, uh, all authority, he says, he says, you either repent or I will remove your lampstand. He says, therefore, remember, verse 5, remember from where you have fallen and repent. Do the deeds you did at first. And obviously he's not talking about all the deeds that he just listed. He's talking about spending time with Christ. He's talking about confessing your sins to Christ, thanking him for the grace of his forgiveness. He's talking about reading his word, being amazed by his kindness and his love for sinners like you, where your heart just gets enthralled with who he is again and afresh and anew. And the gospel isn't something that you just speak about. It's something that you live out, out of thankfulness and gratitude. He says, I'll not have people serving me out of duty. You repent or I remove. You may continue to exist, but I won't be a part of you. There is no one more worthy of our love than Christ, and he will not be served by those who are just doing their duty. Christ is supreme over the church, and so he will assess, and he will purify her 
so that she glorifies him out of love. Now the last duty that Christ performs as head is he secures our life to his. Christ baptizes us with the spirit to make us part of his body. It's a, the body is the metaphor that God has chosen to use to refer to the church. Look with me, please, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, for even as the body is one, and yet has many members, so he's talking about your physical body there, and all the members of the body, though they are many, there's still one body so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all, and the idea is in one spirit, with one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. So the church is Christ's body in the world. The Lord gives several names to his church in the scriptures. They're all meant to convey just how precious the church is to him. Uh, the bride of Christ, the flock of God, God's building, God's field, the household of God. These are all references to the church. These are beautiful names. And think of what, how beautiful they are for what we are, right? Former rebels, redeemed sinners. And he's calling us his bride, his flock, his field, in whom he works. But God has also chosen the symbol of the body to represent the church. You don't have to think too hard to understand why he chose this to be the metaphor for the church. What does a body do? It does the will of the person whose body it is. Which we could say, we could say the will of that person re resides in the head. The head tells the body what to do and not vice versa. The hand doesn't tell the head what to do. It doesn't decide whether or not to do what the head says. Anytime the body doesn't do what the head tells it, that means there's a serious problem. The body does the will of the head. What do we call a body without life? We call it a corpse. A body without life does nothing. And Paul is referring here in, in verse 12, he's not referring to a lifeless body. He's talking about the church as a body that is filled with life, the very life of the Son of God. The body of Christ, the church, it is filled with the life of Christ. Why? So it will do the will of Christ on the earth because he is her head. He's given us not just life, he's given us his life. It's not just generic life. This is the life of Christ given to us, right? When you receive the Spirit, which is what Paul is really talking about here in 1 Corinthians 12, you were baptized by Christ with the Spirit to be incorporated into the body of Christ. He made you part of his body. And Paul likens the receiving of the Spirit, he likens it to baptism. It's an immersion by Christ with the Spirit. Christ is the one doing the baptizing here. The believer is being baptized by Christ with the Spirit to be incorporated into his body. The Spirit of God, he now dwells in you. You are now vitally joined to Christ. His life is now in you. You're like a branch through whom the, you're connected to the vine. The life of the vine is throwing through, flowing through you. You're just a branch. And this is why baptism with the Spirit is the initiatory experience of the believer. Right? The ongoing experience is, what we, is also what we need. We need to be filled with the Spirit. And that's not what he's talking about here. We need to walk with the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. And that's on a daily basis. He's talking about a permanent indwelling of the Spirit in every believer. This is one of the greatest blessings of the new covenant. And he incorporates us into his body. And as his body, you are now to be for Christ what your body is for you. 
You are how Christ lives and works on the earth. In the same way that you express yourself and accomplish your purposes and desires through the body, this is what Christ does through his body, the church. Just as you live inside your body, he lives inside us. Just as your body does the will of your head, as Christ's body, you are to do the will of Christ because he's your head. He's the head of the church. We exist for him. We exist for his purposes, not the other way around. Think about what this means. This means that the pastor, the elders of the church, they are not the body of Christ. The elders are not Christ's body. All of us as his people are his body. You are his body. You are the ones that he says he's going to work through to do the work of ministry. Our responsibility is to train you up. He's given each of you his spirit so that you can be adequate for whatever tasks he has for you to take on. And are you going to serve him? Or are you going to try to be a hand or a foot that tells the head what you will and won't do? See, he's the head, and he expects his body to listen to him. And if that happens, friends, if we are willing and we are eager to be used by him because we know that we are his body on earth, then it's going to get really exciting around. See, when you know that you exist for him and you exist for his glory, and when that grips you, you're done telling God what you will and won't do for him. Instead, you're asking God, what are you doing, Lord, and can I be a part of it? Where are you working, God, and can I be included? Right? You want me to lead a study? I'll lead it, Lord. You want me to go to seminary? Okay, I'll do it. You want me to make disciples of my neighbors? Yes, Lord. Oh, you want to send me across the ocean? Here I am, send me. You're the head. Your life flows through me. I'm your body. Do with me as you will, Lord. Do what's driving your ministry. If it's not a vision of this glorious and supreme Christ, then you are not living and serving as you should. Because you're not seeing him as he is. There's no way you can be, because Christ is the head of the church. He sets her priorities. He safeguards her. He supplies her needs. He seeks those who are lost. He assesses and purifies and secures her life to his. So do you need your vision of Christ restored? Ask his forgiveness. Think of Revelations chapter 2 and his words to the church in Ephesus. Do you need to repent of this loveless serving of Christ? If you do, be ready because you're his body and he'll use you. Serve him as he deserves. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have sent your glorious son to rescue rebels and sinners like us, not just so that we can have heaven, but so that we can now glorify this, this son, this glorious son who gave his life for us, who reigns on high. There is no one higher in authority than him. There is no one above him. The entire earth will be his footstool. Oh, but you have lowered yourself, Lord Jesus, to come and rescue sinners. You've walked amongst us. You've put on humanity so that you could die for us, and you have raised us with yourself. You've united us to yourself so that we can serve and glorify you, not so that we can continue to do our own thing, our own way, following our own priorities and preferences. Oh, God, get our eyes off ourselves. Help us to get our eyes on the Lord Jesus in all his glory and beauty and sufficiency and supremacy so we'll serve him, serve him as his body. Help us to do this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.